next speaker of our session is Levi McClenny from Texas A&M University. And he'll be uh, giving us another different flavor of physics and form neural networks uh, with a self-adaptive nature and using soft attention mechanism. Uh, thank you, Levi, you can go ahead. All right, I appreciate the introduction. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me all right? See everything okay? Yes, everything's perfect. All right, great, absolutely. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak today. There's been a lot of really incredible talks at this conference. It's been really enlightening and um, very, very smart group of people working on these problems and very honored to be uh, to be here and, and presenting this work today. So this is work by myself and my uh, my PhD advisor, Dr. Ulysses Braganetto, both from Texas A&M uh, University Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, and we're working uh, closely affiliated with the U.S. Army Research Lab, so I'm also an ORL journeyman with the U.S. Army Research Lab, and so I have the opportunity to work directly with um, some ARL scientists as well. Uh, and today we're going to be pre presenting some of our joint work, the self-adaptive physics-informed um, neural network uh, using a soft attention mechanism. All right. And so uh, a few um, neural network primitives. Um, I'm not going to belabor this. I, I know that probably at this point in the conference, everybody's seen this same slide about 10 times. And so, uh, but just to build a little bit of a background into what we're doing specifically here, it's worth kind of going through just a few things. So we're kind of considering the general nonlinear PDE form uh, that was proposed uh, or I guess revisited by Raisi and, and Ferdi in 2017. And that's that the sort of what we will refer to uh, forthcoming is the, the baseline pin, but in, in general has this nonlinear term here. It's a function of, of you uh, in a spatiotemporal domain, uh, sort of a pseudo strong form of this PDE, as well as some boundary conditions, uh, boundary conditions and initial conditions uh, that are defined. Um, and in this, you have this U, X, T, and, and W, which is where W is, it denotes the network weights, right? And this is the approximation deep neural network that's essentially approximating your, your underlying PDE solution, as well as this residual term, where that residual term is this, uh, is this nonlinear operator on U of X and T. Uh, and that's sort of a residual deep neural network, you can call it that, or you call it the, which kind of brings into this PDE constrained optimization term that's been floating around lately. And so that's really what that is. And the idea is that that, that residual should, by the end of training, be equal to zero, and that all of your boundary conditions should be fit in sort of a traditional uh, neural network type, type fashion. And so in regards to loss, uh, what we specifically see is sort of this, um, this aggregated loss function here of all these different flavors of uh, of loss from different places in the boundary. So you have um, loss if you're doing some data assimilation, then you have some loss from your data. You have boundary uh, condition loss here. So you're kind of fitting using a mean squared error type loss function. You're fitting your boundaries as well as your initial conditions. Uh, and then once again, that residual is a little different in the sense that you're not necessarily fitting it to a target. You're fitting it, you're trying to minimize that residual so you can kind of view your target as being as being zero, basically. You're, uh, you're trying to minimize that mean squared error loss uh, specifically on those on that residual network. And so that's what actually trains the neural network to fit and mimic the physics. And so knowing that, um, you know, you can go through and you can do a lot of really unique things. And so this is some of the work that was uh, performed by Raisi that we replicated just to kind of illustrate how, how effective this is. Uh, this is actually generated using a package that we have just released called TensorDiff EQ. So you can go through and, and, and solve PDEs in a multi-GPU platform for yourself. And we'll kind of highlight that a little bit more later on. Um, but specifically, the viscous burgers equation, this is kind of a hello world sort of example that is very common to see amongst literature. And so you can see here that this baseline pin art algorithm uh, fits this, uh, the, the viscous burgers equation extremely well. This was highlighted in Raisi's paper, but you can sort of see here that the exact uh, solution and the prediction solution just using the baseline pin are extremely, extremely uh, good. The L2 error is reasonably low. Um, it compared to uh, compared to a numerical method solver, it may be a little higher than people are used to seeing. But as far as a pin is concerned, in doing it approximating in this way, uh, it's it's a pretty a pretty good error. And so we can see here that the actual across the entire domain, uh, the actual the actual uh, solution for, versus the predicted solution are, are almost identical here. So there's not not a lot of error uh, using it. So where in does it start to fall apart? And so we'll go to a, a slightly more advanced case here. In this case, is the Allen Kahn equation for two phase um, two phase microstructure evolution. So we do a lot of work in materials informatics between what we do at Texas A and M and with the Army Research Lab. And so this is the application space that we're primarily interested in is materials. And so um, being able to approximate the Allen Kahn equation, interestingly enough, this is also an example from the Raisi's paper, and they solved it using a discrete pin, a Runge Kutta type pin, and um, but what happens when you apply the baseline pin to this and, and see um, 
and, and try to solve it using just that architecture. And so um, for the solution itself, so we see here that um, as long as, and this is just the solution of the PDE, so this is done using a, a sort of a traditional finite element solver just to get the solution and see what it looks like so that we can compare our architecture to it. So you can see here that there's some really sharp transitions uh, in the domain, especially at the end of the evolution, as well as you kind of got this basin here at the about at the at the uh, on the at the end of the evolution. And so that's all kind of illustrated here. So this is time and then X, and you can kind of see that as you as it evolves, you kind of get these really sharp transitions in the domain. And we've noticed there's been a lot of work lately that this is um, something that's really difficult for neural networks to capture, uh, for specifically for the pin architecture to capture. Um, and this is believed due to spectral bias and inconsistent uh, gradient statistics. So it's cool. This Wang Perdicaris paper keeps coming up. I never calculus talked about it this morning, and the last presenter did as well. So we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, recurring themes here. Whenever these neural networks have issues converging, it typically kind of boils down to some of these some of these issues. So if you were to try to train the baseline pin um, on the Allen Kahn equation, uh, believe it or not, this is actually the trained solution. So if you just go in there. And you train that using uh, this architecture, four layers, 128 neurons, about 200 initial points, 200 boundary points, 20,000 collocation points, so a reasonable number of collocation points, residual points inside the domain. Uh, train for 8,000 atom, and also this should be 8,000 LBFGS iterations. Train for a good amount of time. Then it, it kind of, you can see the eyeball norm says that this completely fails to train. So this is the prediction is the red line, and then the blue line is the actual solution. You can see here that it almost looks like it didn't even do anything. Uh, and so uh, this is this these results are actually confirmed in another paper by Colby White uh, and his advisor, Dr. Zhao um, from Utah State University, so that you can also go to that as well uh, to see that they've also been able to, they got very similar results to this. Uh, we built that, reproduced that locally. Uh, and so you can see here that, so that the pin baseline pin really doesn't handle something like the Allen Kahn equation very well. And so there's been quite a few things to that have come out recently in the last year or so to kind of help this training along, uh, specifically in regards to different loss function weighting schemes. And it's, like I said, some of this was just sort of alluded to in the last talk, and we're going to kind of peel that onion apart a little bit more here. Um, and so, <clears throat> so some of the related work here, we got learning rate annealing, NTK weighting, that's once again from Wang and Perticaris uh, over the last year or so, uh, and into this, actually this year, they've released uh, a couple of papers as well. And then static weighting schemes, where if you go and you just kind of like drop a, 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 a scalar term, a scalar weight term in front of one of, the, one of the terms of the loss function, you can actually see a pretty reasonable amount of improvement just by doing that. So it's kind of a, a brute force approach to solving the problem, but it, it does show some level of improvement if you were to do that. And so here, they, they, all of those solutions generally take this form here where you would drop in a weight and multiply your loss by that weight. And this kind of gets at some of, uh, so early last year, uh, Sifan Wang put, it, put out the um, exploring the uh, gradient, um, the gradient statistics where there's a lot of histograms and he shows that you know some some parts of the uh, some parts of the loss function are are very narrow. The histograms are very narrow. There's not very large in magnitude gradients versus others that are massive. And it's very hard for this to train. So if you just drop a static weight right in front of that, it'll help kind of expand that histogram a little bit. Um, so in the case of those weighting schemes that they pr pr propose, the weighting uh, comes from the, there's a, a strong mathematical basis for some of the weightings, such as NTK. Uh, neural tangent kernels amongst uh, inside the pin itself having to do with the gradients and there's learning rate annealing which has to do with the gradient statistics and how large they are and so it's a term it's a loss term a weight term that's derived from those um, but in our case uh, there's an individual and trainable weight corresponding to each data point and so in this case data points can be residual points uh, inside the domain so if you have 10,000 residual points you would have 10,000 weights associated with those 200 boundary points, uh, you would have 200 boundary point weights. And if you go through and, and individually uh, weight each of those points and make each of those individual weights trainable, uh, how would that affect the solution? And so uh, that's what we've done. And that's kind of our major contribution with this particular work and with this paper is that this is this self-adaptive training, what we've coined to be the self-adaptive training mechanism, where you go through and you actually modify the loss function to include for each term uh, where applicable, right? So you wouldn't wait data, you wouldn't want to wait data necessarily for overfitting reasons, but you can go through and you can wait the residual because we know what the residual should be at each data point, it should be zero. Uh, we know the boundary points, each of those, because you have, you provide a boundary condition. So you know that that boundary condition should be, you know, sine of X or whatever you tell it that it needs to be. So you can go through and you can add these weights in and we think that mathematically that makes sense because you know what that, condition should be. There's no real noise there in a, uh, in a, in a, if you're solving the pin, like using a 
kind of trying to do a, a forward pass solution, then you know what those should be. So if you go through and you modify this loss in this way and include these, uh, these weights here, uh, the actual loss terms themselves are uh, in, incorporate that those weight terms. Once again, these are vectors of weights corresponding to each point in the in in each loss term. Uh, you can roll in and, and we kind of wrap it in this g uh, g function, g lambda function, where g is a non-negative, differentiable, and strictly increasing function. So a function such as a polynomial like x squared or x to the fourth, or it can be a sigmoidal mask, for instance, where you have to kind of create more like a hard attention, either the point is on or off in the solution. And so it goes through, but it allows, uh, having a non-negative differentiable and strictly increasing function allows you to back propagate against that weight. So you can train the weight using standard back propagation from your loss. And so that's what we uh, built here. So um, in order to actually train it, you kind of have this very interesting min-max uh, optimization question that starts to emerge where you wanna minimize the loss with respect to the weights in the network, but you wanna maximize it with respect to the weights at each, uh, the weights along the residual points, the boundary points and the initial points. And, and so the way to actually solve this problem uh, is to do standard gradient descent on all of the neural network weights, the weights and the biases that exist within the network. Uh, but then to actually invert those gradients and cause the weights of the, the cause the weights on the residual um, points or the boundary points or the initial points to increase. And so what this does is it says, hey, those points where the loss is higher, we want those weights to go up because we want to force the neural network weights to cause the network to to lower the loss. So you have this inverting uh, gradient type thing where they where because you increase the weight on each point you cause the neural network to better approximate the solution at that point. Uh, it's essentially, and this is why we kind of coined it the soft attention mechanism, you have this multiplicative mask that causes those, that neural network to pay essentially more attention to those points where the weight is, where the loss is higher. And the result of that is, is that it trains, it trains better and, and faster. And so here, these are kind of a formal definition of the gradients, but what's important to note here is that we're, we're optimizing each of these uh, neural network weights with, with, or each of the weights in the, um, in the lambdas with respect to just that lambda. So you can back propagate through your G function here and you can see that, um, that these masks will actually go through and you can vary the mask, but you can, as long as you can back propagate through that mask, then you can derive these gradients. And so we have a few different masks that we've typed, that we've tried out uh, over the course of the experimentation. And uh, the, the most successful thus far has been the quadratic mask. It's just simply squaring the weight term, squaring the lambda term, and and having that be the weight um, through your training, but you can also add in like a fourth order, for instance, mask, mask function. You can do a smooth logistic mask or a, sm or a sharp logistic mask, and this would sort of to simulate the point being on or off in the solution, so it may not need to know that particular point, so it shuts it off, or it may need to know more of it, so it kind of finds itself in the center, but what we've seen here is that, especially out in these extents here, you'll end up seeing a lot of vanishing gradients. So the, the sigmoidal masks, uh, are, are actually less effective than the quadratic masks, although it does kind of like get at this, this hard, hard attention me uh, mechanism of actually turning points on or off based on whether or not you need them in the training. Um, but so far empirically, we've observed that quadratic masks have, have done the best. Uh, fourth order masks, you get into some, some gradient issues with, uh, with you know, numerical stability and taking the gradients and applying them because you end up multiplying terms or, you know, to the power of four. And so it just gets really big and unwieldy. Uh, so quadratic masks really kind of be find we found have to be a, to be a smooth uh, a smooth middle here, and so with this formulation in place, uh, how well does it work? Uh, that's the logical question to ask. So returning to our Allen Kahn example uh, from 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 a couple of slides ago, with the exact same neural network architecture, the only modification is that we've added this extra layer of weights. Uh, re re recall that the baseline pin looks something along these lines. You can see here that it completely failed to train for this particular problem. Um, but we can see here from this sort of static cr cross section of, if you will, of the domain that actually the exact solution and the prediction are pretty well, very I eyeball norm, very close. And we'll have some numbers in the next slides to how accurate this is. And you can also see here that as the evolution moves along, um, that it, it, it is, especially compared to the baseline, extremely accurate. Now we have some residuals here 
Um, and this was trained for 8,000 Atom and 8,000 LBFGS. You can increase that training. And actually what we do see here is that increasing that training in this example, increasing the training time to 20, 30, 40,000 iterations of training didn't do anything to help out. Uh, however, what we found in this is that if you increase that, you will see a reasonable amount of accuracy, you know, to obviously to a certain extent, because we're using gradient descent methods. So you're getting down to point, you know, one to the negative ninth accuracy is, is tough to do when you're doing a standard, you know, SGD or Adam type optimizer. Um, and so, uh, so some numbers on this and, and about how uh, well this is approximated. Um, so here in the Allen Kahn equation, uh, that, that same example we were just looking at, this is actually what the multiplicative mass to weights end up looking like. Uh, and so it's kind of interesting to just take a look at this plot. So if you compare it, so this is the same plot here in space and time. So this is the solution that we, that we end up seeing. So this is what the, that output X versus T ends up looking like. And if you take a look at what this, what the weights end up being, it actually heavier, more heavier weights, uh, the initial points in that time domain, um, in that time domain to, to, to yield a more exact solution. So it's interesting is that even though the nonlinear pieces of the, the, or the, the more, the more sharp transition pieces of the solution occur later on in the evolution, it more, it requires weighting uh, more heavier, more more heavily in the beginning of the of the evolution, and so this is sort of consistent with some of the things that were observed empirically in the sense that if you, you need to more heavier, more heavily weight the initial uh, boundary, for instance, uh, and this was if you go back to the static weighted loss function or a or a um, uh, you know if you just kind of throw a scalar in front of that initial condition term in your loss function, if you just multiply it by say hundred, um, it fits way better. Uh, it doesn't fit as good as this, but it fits way better. So we kind of, agree, this agrees somewhat with what has been observed empirically in the sense that you need to more heavier, heavily weight your initial conditions uh, for this, at least for this particular solution. Um, so we do have some other problems that uh, are in the paper. So we've, we've done this something similar with the Helmholtz PD. We've done something similar, uh, st uh, steady state Helmholtz. And we've done something similar with the Berger's equation that was shown in the first example here, both of which have improved. And you kind of see as a weight mask that, that aligns with what you would expect it to, at least in, especially in the Berger's equation, you have a nice line of weights right across that nonlinear region in the center. Um, and so it's, it, it's, it, it, we, it works really well. If you can see here quantitatively, it really improves uh, the percentage of accuracy, especially seeing the original pin is 96. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it essentially fails to train completely. We get it down to about 2% plus or minus, uh, plus or minus one. So this is over 10 runs. The initialization, uh, it is somewhat prone to initialization issues in the, in the weights, the, uh, the, the magnitude of them, but not necessarily, you know, random initializations. It's very reliable in training. Um, but we do see that you need to more maybe multiply the initial weights by about a, a value of 100 before you start training, and that results in a better solution. Um, and so some of the implementations. So first, we have a standalone SA pins implementation written in TensorCore 2.0. It's here. It's hosted on my GitHub uh, SA pins, as well as we have an implementation in TensorDPQ, which is the package I alluded to a little bit earlier. We just released in the last couple of weeks. It also rolls in, as well as having baseline multi-GPU pin solvers. It also has in the self-adaptive architecture, which can be used to solve and apply toward problems. Uh, you can go through, define your domain, your boundary conditions, and then uh, hit model.fit and solve your PDE that way. So um, with that, I will a uh, couple of acknowledgments, uh, Dr. Arajave at Texas A&M, as well as Dr. Hailey at the U.S. Army Research Lab for their support uh, with this research. Uh, the ARL, I owe a lot. They've helped me out with computational resources as well. So Dr. Hailey's been a huge asset uh, in this work. And so with that, I will um, I'll yield the floor to questions. Thank you, Levi. That was a great talk. Um, are, are there any questions? Uh, we have a little bit of time. So I had one quick question. Um, how much do you think, uh, how much change do you see between uh, the training times of say the baseline pin and the one with the self-adaptivity? Because I'm thinking in terms of like having to apply this to more large scale problems, 3D problems, where you have to have a lot of points, a lot of collocation points and boundary points. Uh, if you wanna weight every one of them, how does that translate to training time? Yeah, absolutely. So it does, uh, it does slightly increase the training time, but in regards to, I mean, you're taking a lot of gradients when you train a neural network anyway. So we are adding in this, this extra layer of them. Um, so we did see, you know, we do see a slight decrease, but even training across 20, 30,000 collocation points, 
uh, and in the tensor diff EQ package, I've run uh, not the self adaptive pin, but a regular baseline solver on, on you know, 500,000 or so. And, and you can, it, it's, um, if you need to parallel it, you can. It's the code is written in GPU, uh, the code is written to be GPU optimized and is heavily profiled to do so. And so um, it does add a, a a layer of uh, slowdown, but it's not something that causes, you know, it's not orders of magnitude. I mean, it's it's a few maybe milliseconds per training iteration. Uh, and so in the grand scheme of things, the accuracy you get out of it, um, we think kind of outweighs the fact that it's slightly slower to train, but very, very, very slightly slower to train. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, that sounds very exciting.